hey, what's up? I'm, I'm underwater again because I wound up doing another mermaid thing not long after the last mermaid thing. This wasn't my intention. It's just sort of what happened. This time it's the Sirena Legacy, and it was actually pretty fun to read. Like, it's not good, but it has just enough weird zany stuff in there to be entertaining. And it also had a few things in there that caught me off guard. You know, th things I wasn't expecting. Now, The Sirena Legacy is a paranormal young adult romance from the early 2010s, so you expect it to follow a pretty strict formula. You know, regular human girl meets supernatural boy, probably doesn't realize he's supernatural at first, but after a little while figures it out. They fall in love, something threatens their ability to be together, and then girl has to play a key role in preventing some sort of supernatural threat from ending the world and then there's a big final battle at the end. Like, that's usually what happened. There's a few variations, but that is the gist of it. The Sirena Legacy follows that formula, but with a few small twists thrown in. You know, I have, for reasons I'm still unsure of, I have read a fair number of these types of books, so anything different at all is more than welcome to me. The trilogy goes of Poseidon, of Triton, and of Neptune which are kind of dumb names and they sound really awkward in pretty much any sentence. You know, I, I would have preferred if they called it like Gift of Poseidon because that actually makes sense in the context of the story, but okay, sure, no one cares what James thinks. Uh, the story is about a girl named Emma who is normal in most ways except that she has white hair and violet, violet eyes, which no one else seems to have, and once she was saved from drowning by talking to some fish. No one believes her when she tells them that last story. Like, it was, she was about four years old, she almost drowned in a pond behind her grandmother's house, but then she asked the fish for help and they helped save her, but no one believes her when they, she tells them that. And one day, when she's on vacation, she meets a mysterious boy about her age named Galen. Very quickly, she learns that Galen is a sirena, which is basically a mermaid, and he's actually a prince of the Sirena, so he's not just some rando. Sirena can actually sense each other when they're underwater or when they're close together on land, and to Galen, Emma feels like a Sirena, but in most ways she seems human and he doesn't recognize her, so he's really confused at first. From there, they fall in love and they try to figure out what exactly Emma is and how she fits into the world of Sirena. And as we figure out what exactly is going on, there becomes well, it becomes doubtful that Emma and Galen can be together, even though they're in love. So again, it's formulaic, but it has a few twists I didn't expect. They're mostly small twists, but I, again, I, I didn't expect them. Emma is, you know, she's a dull character. She's the main protagonist of a paranormal romance. There, there's nothing much to say about her. She just exists. Galen is also dull, but He's not outright abusive, so I guess that's nice. The, the bar is in hell, but he did manage to clear it. Their relationship is, at least at a few points, it's, it's kind of cute. Some of the side characters have a bit of personality and a little bit of depth, particularly Emma's mom, who w we'll get to her <laughs> later, don't worry. But yeah, you'd think main character's parent would just sort of be there and not contribute much, but no, she actually does have some depth to her. The setting is a little bit interesting, although it doesn't make that much sense. And they also bring up some neat ideas and some uh, themes that they don't properly explore, but they do at least bring them up. The books are written kind of weird though, because half the time it's written from Emma's first person POV, and it's present tense, which some people hate first person present tense. I don't have strong feelings on it. I, I think it actually can be useful and valuable in certain contexts, but for the most part people just use it the same way they use past tense, but whatever. Half the books are first person present tense, and the other half are third person present tense, and I have never seen that. I actually did a poll on Twitter and apparently other people have seen that, so I'm alone in this, but it just, it threw me off. You know, I would have preferred if it was just half of it from Emma's perspective and half from Galen's perspective, or the whole thing was just in third person because you're switching between first and third is always awkward. So overall, there's a few things to like and a few things to dislike here. I don't recommend reading The Sirena Legacy overall because, well, you know, we'll get more into that as this video goes on. It's just not that good. However, I do recommend watching this video. That way you can know all of the fun parts of it without having to go to the trouble of reading through on your own. So from here on out, there will be heavy spoilers for the whole series. Just, just be aware. 
Just, just warning you. Hey, I've got an idea. Why don't you come to the scary, isolated payphone on the bad side of town, alone? So, like I said, it's about Emma. She is a normal 18-year-old girl who's about to start her final year in high school. She lives in New Jersey, but at the beginning of the book, she is on vacation in Florida with her best friend. And when she's on the beach in Florida, she runs into Galen and his younger sister, Raina. She notices that the two of them have the same white hair and purple eyes that she has, which she thinks is weird, but she moves on pretty quickly. Now, Galen and Raina, because again, this switches perspectives, they both sense that that she's a sirena, but she feels different somehow, and they don't exactly know what's going on because sirena are, they do have a human form, but they're not supposed to use it for more than 24 hours at a time, so they're just keeping an eye on her. Later, Emma and her friend are out swimming, and they're attacked by a shark, and her friend is killed. These types of books often have a best friend character, who is usually just there to maybe have a few funny lines and maybe give the main character so much to voice her thoughts to. So you would expect the childhood friend who gets brought up to stick around for a while, but no, she dies after like three chapters. Which is what I mean when I say that these books do have some deviations from the standard formula. You know, they, they do switch things up a little bit. Now, during the attack, Emma tries fighting the shark and it doesn't do much, but then at the end she just tells the shark to leave and it obeys. But by then, her friend, her friend's name is Chloe, by the way, uh, by then, Chloe's already dead. So Galen is nearby, and he goes and saves Emma, but she still thinks that he's a human. And after hearing this, you might think, like, oh, okay, this is part of some, like, nefarious villain plot, right? Like, they sent the shark over there to attack and try and kill Emma, and it just didn't work. But no, apparently there really was just a shark nearby that attacked them. And I do want to say one thing. Galen and his sister were keeping an eye on Emma to see if she transformed to save her friend because they're thinking, okay, if she's a sirena, she's gonna turn into her sirena form, grow up, you know, a fin and save her friend and swim away or something. But she doesn't do that and they didn't help even though they did witness the attack. And this never comes back up at any point. Because that's what heroes do. So Emma goes back to Jersey, and Galen and Reyna decide to follow her and figure out who slash what she is. Now, a brief note here, they are Sirena. Their father is actually a Sirena king, because there's, there's two Sirena kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Triton and the kingdom of Poseidon. Now, there were actual, actually two Sirena named Triton and Poseidon. They were leaders thousands of years ago, and their descendants rule their kingdoms. So uh, Reyna and Galen are descendants of the house of Triton, and then there's also the House of Poseidon. Put a pin in that. The backstory of the Sirena and how their kingdoms were founded and everything is bizarrely complicated, so I'm not gonna go into it here. I appreciate that the author tried to give this world some dimension and some depth. I don't think it quite worked, but I do appreciate that she tried because many others would have just said, yeah, mermaids are a thing, and then left it at that. So Galen is a prince of the House of Triton, but he does have an older brother. His older brother is named Grom, and he is actually the heir. Galen is the ambassador to the human world. I'm not totally sure why that's a thing, because they're secret, and most humans don't know about them. So Galen, unlike other Sirena, is allowed to stay in his human form for more than a day at a time. And Reyna, while she's not technically supposed to, she does go along with him to Jersey, because she's engaged to a guy that she hates and is staying out of the ocean to avoid him. Now, Galen enrolls in school and goes to school with Emma for a little bit, even though he's 20 years old, so it's, that was funny to me to imagine a 20-year-old guy still in high school. And he's able to do all of this because he does have two human friends that knows he is a sirena. There's Rachel, who he actually lives with, he stays at her house there. Uh, she was formerly in the Mafia before she faked her death at some point. And there's also Dr. Milligan, who found out about sirena, and he agrees to help Galen with some things uh, in exchange for being allowed to like study Galen's anatomy. And Milligan is just kind of there. I don't have much to say about him. Rachel, on the other hand, straddles the line between being funny and helpful and just being annoying. Like, I, I listen to these as audiobooks, and the audiobook narrator, whenever Rachel is talking, they, they tried to do a Jersey accent, but it just winds up sounding like Peter Griffin fucked Carmela Soprano. And it's very, very distracting. Galen, the way to a woman's heart is showing your true self. Like, I, I can't quite do it, but that's how she sounds. And it's 
nails on a chalkboard every time. That said, Rachel does know a lot of stuff, and she helps the characters with problems big and small, so, you know, my thoughts on her are kind of mixed. You know, she gives Galen advice on how to get Emma to like him and how to navigate human society, and she also is always going on about shoes and fashion and stuff, which I, I think it's intended to be funny, but I'm, I'm honestly not sure. I don't know. I just, I needed to bring her up because she does play a role in this series. So anyways, Galen and Emma go to school together. She's clearly attracted to him, but tries to avoid him because we need conflict. You know the drill. You know these types of books. Uh, she learns pretty quickly that he's not a human, and she takes it remarkably well, all things consider. And then she starts wondering what's going on with her, because not only does she have the weird hair and eyes, and she uh, feels like a sirena to the other sirena, but she also learns that she can hold her breath for hours at a time. And with practice, she extends that even further. Uh, please note that sirena don't have gills, they're, they have lungs, and their lungs just absorb oxygen from the water. That doesn't make sense. But she can also command fish to follow her instructions like Aquaman. And the only people that can do that are descendants of Poseidon. Like, that power to control fish is referred to as the gift of Poseidon. Now, again, the backstory of this series is... Again, it's, it's just weirdly complicated and also just more interesting than the actual books. But uh, the last Poseidon heir was engaged to Grom, who was Galen's older brother, remember? And she died decades ago. She was killed by a sea mine in an explosion. Put a pin in that. So the Poseidon king, Antonius, has sworn to never sire another heir and never unite his kingdom with the kingdom of Triton. Emma seems like a sirena, but she can't transform. And again, she feels a little bit different to Galen and others, so like, what is she? So they go to Dr. Milligan, who knows about Sirena again, and he just goes, yeah, you're half Sirena, after a couple of tests. And Galen, G Galen knows that half-breeds exist. They haven't been mentioned in the book up until this point, but Galen has known about it this whole time, and he's shocked by this. Like, the possibility of someone who seems kinda human, but kinda Sirena, being a half-breed just never crossed his mind even though it's explicitly illegal for Sirena to have children with humans, meaning he knows it's possible and it's not just a legend, and the origin of the two kingdoms is tied in with Poseidon killing a bunch of half-breeds. So again, he knows this is a thing, and he just never at any point said, well, hey, Emma, maybe you're a half-Sirena. Let's go check with the doctor. I... Emma's dad actually died a few years before the story begins, so they can't ask him anything, but they start looking into him. Was he secretly a sirena? I mean, probably not, but they, they don't really know. And they see her mom, and she has blonde hair and blue eyes, which is not like the white and purple that sirena have, so they don't think it's her. Emma does ask her mom who her real parents are, thinking like, oh, okay, I was clearly adopted, but her mom shuts her down and says, no, you weren't adopted. Galen does some investigating of historical archives underwater, and he finally has an epiphany, and then he goes to Emma's house and confronts her mom and says, hey, you are the supposedly dead Poseidon princess, and that's the end of book one. And it's actually a pretty good cliffhanger. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, in retrospect, the twist is really, really obvious, but I, I don't know, just the way it was written in the book, it did catch me off guard, and it makes perfect sense. So we have book two, which is of Triton, which begins with Emma and her mom already on the run. See, mom, Emma's mom, thinks that she actually killed Grom in the explosion, like the sea mine explosion that she supposedly died in. She thinks that she killed a prince in that, and that if she went back to the ocean, she would be executed. On top of that, she does also have, you know, a half-breed daughter, so she thinks that she'll be killed for that, and Emma will also be killed. So, off-screen... We don't actually see this, it happens off screen. She subdues Galen and Reyna and ties them up, knocks out Emma with chloroform, and then forces her into a car and they drive off. <laughs> like this, 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 again, this woman is a, she's a nurse now. She's not like a warrior or anything, and she wasn't a warrior back when she was living in the Sirena world. She's just a nurse and she kicks Galen's ass. Now, while they're driving, Emma tries to explain the, the situation to her. She says, oh no, you weren't killed in the explosion, neither was Grom. Grom is still alive, he's just underwater right now. But her mom doesn't believe her. She thinks that Galen is misleading her to try and lure her and her mom out into the open so that they can both be killed. Which is not actually a bad thing to think. Like, it, that makes sense. 
I should mention that sirena age really, really slowly. They, they age slow on land and even slower in the water. We never find out exactly how old Emma's mom is, but I think she's about 80 or 90 years old because the explosion that killed her was during World War II. And, and she was like late teens or early 20s when that happened. And she's been living on land ever since, but she looks like she's about 40 years old by human standards. So I mean, si Sirena live a long time. Anyways, her and Emma's dad met much, much later after she'd been on land for a long time. And they were just friends. Uh, not, we don't get a lot of details. She refers to Emma's conception as just being a mistake, which makes me think they only had sex one or two times before like, oh, okay, this happened. Uh, and then they just got married out of convenience, which seems a little weird. I didn't, I don't feel like they had to do that, but okay, sure. So after about 20% of the book, Galen manages to track them down, or rather Rachel does, because again, she was in the mafia, which means she can do everything doesn't actually make a lot of sense but sure whatever she she manages to track them down uh but they're driving on the highway so she's chasing them down in a car for a while and then emma's mom pulls out a gun which she apparently had this whole time and then shoots at rachel which causes her to go off the road and crash and they are concerned that they killed her so they pull over to check ha and rachel is shot but it only got her in the foot so she's all right and she actually manages to subdue and handcuff emma's mom Again, remember, Sirena are way, way stronger than humans, and Emma's mom was able to fight two Sirena and also Emma by herself, and Rachel is able to take her down. I, I don't believe that. That doesn't make sense. So finally, Galen arrives along with his brother Graminto, and Emma's mom sees him and realizes, oh, shit, he really is alive. And she's instantly back in love with him, even though she hasn't seen him for a about 70 years. I, I, I think the whole point of her marrying Emma's dad just being a marriage of convenience and then instantly falling back in love with Grom, that seems to be saying like something that's kind of common in these types of books where you can only ever really love one person. <laughs> and it's just kind of annoying. Like the person you fall in love with when you're 16 is probably not going to be the person you stay with your entire life. So Emma's mom goes with the others into the ocean to try and sort out some business. Basically, there was an agreement a long time ago that the House of Poseidon and Triton, the, the two houses had to be bound together, uh, the heirs had to get married. And there's a lot of, like, legal drama stuff going on here, like, can a Galen and Emma get married? Will Emma and her mom be executed for breaking the law? Like, it, these are the big questions. There's also a subplot going through these first two books about Grom marrying someone who also seems to have the gift of Poseidon, except she doesn't really have the gift, she's just faking. I, I, it becomes semi-relevant in a bit, so I guess put a pin in that. Now, Emma's mom sees King Antonius, who is her father, uh, again for the first time in decades, and they're really, really happy to see each other. That, okay, it actually makes sense, and it's kind of sweet to see. But she's also held prisoner for a bit. There's a whole subplot about her escape. And then they have this like weird, very long courtroom sequence or something kind of similar to a courtroom sequence. Basically, there's a few Sirena who want to like abolish their monarchy and replace it with a democratic system, which is based. Uh, but the books make them out to be villains, which is cringe. After some back and forth and some false betrayals, Emma finally just goes underwater and demonstrates her powers to the Sirena. Like, she can talk. I don't know how they talk underwater, but <laughs> they talk underwater, and Emma commands the fish and tells them to do stuff, and everyone's like, oh my god, you really are the heir of Poseidon. And in a series with better pacing, I think this would all just be the second half of book one, because book one is really stretched out, book two is really stretched out, and then as we'll get into book three, a lot of stuff is crammed into it, so I feel like, just okay, we'll talk about that more in a bit. One of the Sirena stabs Emma, but Galen swims super fast and gets her to a doctor because, turns out, he has the gift of Triton, and it was just now awoken. Or rather, he has half the gift of Triton, which is where his fin just gets really, really big compared to other Sirena, and so he can swim fast. And Reyna has the other half of the, half of the gift, which is that she can control water, so she can make waves and stuff. And all the Sirena pledge their undying loyalty to their rightful rulers and qu swear to never again question their masters, and uh... This isn't subtext, this is just text. This is just what the book says. <laughs> and the peasant girl who tried to marry into the royal family is made out to be a villain, you know, like, How dare you have aspirations beyond your station? Like, that sort of thing. That's, uh... 
that's a thing that happens. So anyways, we need a climax. So it turns out that a sirena has been captured by humans and soon they're gonna realize what's going on and reveal their existence to the world. So Emma and company bring a wave to their island and flood it, but they make sure to put some life jackets around, that way people can put them on and none of them drown. And they save everybody. No one drowns except for, unfortunately, Rachel, because she was on a boat throwing the life jackets out right beforehand and she got caught and arrested and put into a jail cell. Although, what? She, they might have just arrested her for being annoying because while she was throwing out the life jacket, she was saying, I don't want these anymore. The color is bad. It doesn't match my hair. <laughs> Again, I'm not, I'm really not exaggerating. That's the voice they go with. <laughs> so anyway, she was in a jail cell when the wave hit and she drowned and Galen feels awful about it. And just, that's the end of book two. And you're thinking like, okay, where the conflict's over. Where does book three go? Book three honestly feels like it belongs in a completely different series because normally these ter terrible paranormal romances end on some big final battle. You know, sometimes the big final battle is properly foreshadowed. Sometimes it comes out of nowhere. But Of Neptune doesn't have that. And it's simultaneously kind of neat because just because the novelty of it, you know, it's a little bit different than what I was expecting but it's also dull because they don't really replace it with anything else. So Emma's mom is getting married to Grom and she's gonna go back into the ocean and live out her life there among her old family and everything. Emma is about to finish high school and she's unsure about whether she wants to live in the ocean or not because she could go in there and live with her mom and Galen and everyone else, but all she knows is the land. And Galen actually wants her to come to the ocean with him because Sirena live longer underwater. You know, it's. It's explained that, like, uh, again, they age slowly on land, but they age even slower underwater because their organs just work harder on land. Like, their heart beats faster, and they, they, they just, their parts wear out faster. Now, Galen doesn't straight up tell her this. He just tells her, hey, I want you to come live underwater with me. And it's clear that Rachel's death affected him, and he doesn't want to lose Emma, too, which seemed obvious to me from the beginning, and it's actually reasonable, you know, like it, his friend just died, he doesn't want to lose any other loved ones, and he doesn't want to watch Emma grow old and waste away while he's, you know, still young, so it, it makes sense. But it also takes Emma about three quarters of the book to figure it out. <laughs> Which is dumb on its own, but it's also just not that much of a conflict, because if she has to choose between, oh, which world will I live in, she has no more friends or family on land, so there's not much of a temptation for her to stay, so there's not much of a choice. And, spoiler alert, she does go underwater and live there at the end. Anyways, Emma's grandfather Antonius tells her that she should visit a town that he visited once a long time ago called Neptune. It's near Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he's cryptic about what's there, but her and Galen decide to drive off and visit. And upon arrival, they immediately meet a half sirena boy whose name is Reed. Turns out there's actually a few hundred freshwater sirena living here in secret. They, they swim in like the lakes and rivers and stuff. The backstory of how they got there, again, it's weirdly complicated, and it ties in with the origins of the sirena society and the founding of the Triton and Poseidon kingdoms. The short version is that they left the ocean millennia ago, a long, long time ago, and they lived in Spain for a while, but in 1492 they got thrown out along with the Jews and Muslims. This is not, doesn't even make sense! Uh, and then they decided to, they landed in America and they settled here and they've been there ever since. It's, it's actually implied that there are probably other towns around the world that are similar to Neptune, but no one knows exactly how many or where they are. It's also not clear if freshwater sirena are biologically different than the ocean ones because Galen does have trouble swimming in fresh water, but that might just be a matter of practice. And when he senses Reed, he says that it's unlike anything he's sensed before, even though he, he has sensed half Sirena because he sensed Emma before, which, which seems to be saying that Reed being half freshwater Sirena instead of half ocean Sirena is something else entirely, but it's just not explored or made super clear. Anyways, the people of Neptune just blend in with human society and they stay hidden because uh, they are, many of them are mixed blood, even though some of them do have the gift of Poseidon, like multiple people there have the gift of Poseidon, just like Emma. Uh, and they want to visit the ocean, but they know that they'll be killed by the ocean sirena because, again, half-breeds are illegal. At the end of book two, they like 
barely accepted Emma, and that's really just because she has the gift of Poseidon, and they found that to be valuable and useful. A after they're introduced to this, just uh, some things happen. I don't know how else to describe the plot of this final book. Some things happen. Galen and Emma have a fight about him wanting her to move to the ocean with him. He tries to leave town, but is kidnapped and held hostage for a while and mildly tortured. Emma and Reed form a leg of the most half-assed love triangle that has ever been put on the page. There's some back and forth about the leaders of Neptune disagreeing about ways to contact the ocean because they all want to be able to go to the ocean, but they aren't sure about how they should reveal themselves and how to form uh, connections with the ocean sirena. The final villain is a guy who goes on a lot about how awful democracy is <laughs> and how it doesn't work. It's, it, it is honestly strange to me how anti-democracy these books are. Not just because a fucking paranormal young adult romance is taking sides on that topic, but also how heated they get about it. Because <laughs> in fantasy, there is a trope about how everything will be great as long as the rightful king is on the throne, but in that case, like, that, that's pro-monarchy, but it's subtext. It's subtextually pro-monarchy. The Sirena legacy is very explicitly pro-monarchy. I, I don't know exactly how or why this came to be. There's another final villain as well. His name is Dr. Kennedy. He's a human scientist who has a reputation as a crazy mermaid hunter because he saw Sirena and went looking for proof of them forever, and he blames the Sirena for ruining his career. Anyways, King Antonius actually learned of Neptune many, many years ago, but he kept it secret because, again, he knew that if he told everybody, hey, there's a bunch of mixed bloods up there, then people would be upset and possibly go out and try to attack them. And he sent Emma to try and force contact between the two sides and also get the Ocean Sirena to be okay with half-breeds like Emma because Emma's existence is kind of tenuous at this point and he doesn't want people changing their minds uh, or the more hardline people in society to take control and actually go after and try and kill Emma. But he also knows that one of these days, uh, humans and Sirena, th the humans are going to find out about us. We're going to have to form some sort of uh, communication link with the humans. And he thinks that uh, learning about Neptune is a good first step towards that. And honestly, that, that all makes sense. Like, yeah, King Antonius being kind of cagey about this makes sense. His overall goals are reasonable. His plan makes sense. Like, yeah, I, I, I got very little to say about that. That said, there's not much of a climax to the series here. Like, the Freshwater and Ocean Sirena talk to each other and they agree to coexist peacefully and not kill each other. And the Freshwater and Ocean Sirena can go into each other's territory with no issues. And they also agree not to kill mixed bloods. And then Emma and Galen get married. They have a Sirena wed wedding underwater, but then they go to an island to have sex for the first time, and then it ends. And kind of a sweet ending, if I'm being honest. Like, re remember years ago I complained about how Fallen would have been good, or the ending of Fallen would have been good if they had had to work for their happy ending? These guys did have to work for it. I'll, I'll give them that. Like, I didn't do a, a, a great job showing that in the summary, I don't think. But there was some real doubt that Emma and Galen would be allowed to be together. They had to make peace for it to work. So, yeah, I don't have a lot to analyze here, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, but this did make me think a few times. You know, I like some of the ideas here. I like the idea of the Sirena discovering a hidden community of their fellows on land. However, one book isn't enough time to properly introduce that concept, explore it, bring up conflicts associated with it, and then resolve those conflicts in any sort of satisfying way. Everything in book three happens way, way, way too fast. I think I would have preferred to see a version of this story where Emma knows about her heritage, like she knows she's half Sirena from the start and she has to hide it. You know, it's that whole seemingly normal girl in seemingly normal town meets a supernatural hottie, but they come from different worlds. Can they be together? You know, like it's a standard story, but at least it is a story. Uh, maybe Emma lives in Neptune and she knows to fear the ocean sirena for her entire life, but then one day she meets Galen and realizes, oh, okay, maybe, maybe he's all right. Maybe we can reveal ourselves to them and then just, you know, explore the way that that works. You know, that would be kind of neat. Or we could leave things as they stand now, but we just combine books one and two so, because 
like they, they have a lot of bloat. They could probably be trimmed down a lot and be one book and it would work out okay. Uh, but then book three gets split because that one is rushed and goes too fast and we could use some more time to explore all these ideas. Then it would still be a trilogy, but it would be one with much better pacing. We could properly explore the relationship between Neptune and the ocean. You know, what does it mean to have humans and Sirena living together? What difficulties will the characters face when trying to make that happen on a larger scale? Emma gives up her life on the land in order to be with Galen. How does that affect her? Maybe she doesn't give up her life on the land. Maybe she just lives half in the land and half in the ocean. And everyone else has to learn to live with that. And she forms a link between the two sides. Like, that That would be neat. And like I said, the Sirena legacy does... It, it does break the mold in a few small ways. You know, Emma's best friend dies right away. Neither Galen nor Emma know exactly what's going on at first, instead of just, you know, the dude knows what's going on from the beginning, but he won't tell the main character. Uh, which is really obnoxious and I don't like seeing it. Uh, there's no big final battle either, you know, and so it breaks the mold in a few ways. There's also some parts in here that were just funny because of how silly they were. Like, I, I haven't mentioned all of them, but there's a bit where a bunch of girls at their school are just obsessed with Galen and borderline stalk him to try and date him because he's just so hot, even though it's made clear that he's kind of socially awkward and the girls don't really care, they just think he's so hot that that overcomes his social awkwardness. <laughs> or how Sirena actually can't mate in their fish form because they don't have any reproductive organs, so after they get married they go on land to have children, and so I think the author was just trying to avoid the question of monster fucking, <laughs> which means she's a coward. But that also causes me to wonder, like, okay, are, are women Sirena, are they in human form for the entirety of their pregnancy? I don't think so, but it, I, like, I'm wondering now. In many of these types of books, the main character's love interest will give her some sort of cutesy nickname, and one of the most common ones I see, but also the laziest, is just Angel. You know, like, there's no imagination there, it's just, hey, Angel, I love you, like, just, it, it's dumb. And I think the author of that understood this, because in this series, Aelin refer or Galen refers to Emma as Angel Fish. That's literally, that's just a fish. And it's not like he sees an angel fish the day he meets her and so he associates those two things or anything. Like he, that's just a fish. Like imagine if someone gave a cutesy nickname to their girlfriend and it was just a random land animal. Like he just called her coyote or something. As I, 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 what? <laughs> it just made me laugh. Now, Galen and Emma are married, and Emma's mom and Grom, Galen's older brother, are married. Meaning that Emma's mom at the end of the series is now also her sister-in-law, and her new stepfather is also her husband's brother? And no one at any point brings this up or seems to think it's strange. Okay, I don't have much else to say. This is, this is just an odd little book series that... I haven't heard anyone else talk about it, and it does stand out in my mind. You know, it's clear that there was effort, but it also feels like the author didn't really know where to put that effort. <laughs> because while it's clearly trend chasing, it doesn't feel like it's trend chasing that much. You know, that's why there's no final battle, that's why the conflict is resolved peacefully and with both sides being pretty reasonable, and why the love triangle is never treated all that seriously. Like, it's trend chasing, but it's at the same time not really following that trend. <laughs> it's kind of sweet in a few ways, and I will remember it. Uh, even when the details fade from my memory, I think the vibe is always going to be there. I don't have a lot else to say. Anyways, uh, subscribe to this channel, like this video, buy my merch, like, like this sweater I'm wearing. You can also get it in the form of like a t-shirt and stuff. Uh, all that other important stuff, I'll see you later. Bye. Hello there! This is the end of the video, which means all the patron names are gonna be here on screen. My $10 and up patrons are Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodes, Carolina Clay, Ich Bin Longweilig, Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Mr. A5013, Proscriptions of Duo Jang, Rovi, Psych XS, Slumbering Jellyfish Observing Outer Space, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Ve Victus, and Wesley. All these people, all the other names, you're all great. Also, shout out to my YouTube channel members who aren't here, but they also get access to things like early access to videos, they get one exclusive video a month, you know.
that sort of stuff. It's great. If you feel like doing that, either join Patreon or join the channel. Or just like the video, comment, subscribe to my channel, share it around, make sure it gets to people. Uh, I also have merchandise available, so check some of that out if you're curious. Uh, don't have anything else to add, but, you know, you're all still watching, so I may as well keep talking. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.